Welcome to Suhan Unfiltered. I'm Jim Suhan. My guest tonight at Kieran's Irish Pub, right across from Target Center, right on your way to the Timberwolves game, if you care to go. Uh, Roy Smalley, baseball savant. Can I call you savant? I don't want to. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to underplay it. Savant, okay with you, Roy? I uh, know Roy. Roy's one of my favorite. He's my favorite baseball storyteller. Uh, has great insights in the game. We're going to talk baseball. We're going to talk a little. Believe it or not, we're going to talk some golf and some music as well. Again, we are live at Kieran's Pub. Yeah, no kidding. Live at Kieran's Pub. The place is packed, but there are a few seats open if you want to slide by. Timberwolves game tonight starting at seven at Target Center. Again, this is Suhan Unfiltered at SuhanUnfiltered.com. You can always find the podcast. You can follow the Live and Social Network on Twitter and find a bunch of people uh, with their podcasts. One quick promo for me. Uh, my next gig will be Friday night at O'Gara's, 5 o'clock, with Star Tribune hockey writer Michael Russo, my buddy. And then my band, Roy, is going to debut at 7.30 at O'Gara's, playing until about 9, uh, leading into the live karaoke in, uh, in O'Gara's shanty. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to give you a chance to plug. You're not just a, a baseball analyst. You actually run a business. Tell me about your business and how you ended up getting into it. Oh, well, thanks. I wasn't expecting to plug, but I have to talk about a little bit. I'm with Morgan Stanley, wealth management. What we do, I lead a team of folks over there. We manage individuals and families' portfolios. So I am the portfolio manager, wealth advisor over there. Financial planning and uh, portfolio construction, uh, all the all the uh, wealth uh, management uh, aspects of the right. And how did you get into it? It's not a natural leap necessarily from baseball player to financial. Well, analyst. it's I guess it's not um, from a um, background and training standpoint going from baseball to that. But on the other hand, it sort of is. I I got into it uh, right out of baseball. I ran the uh, I was executive director hired by. Erwin Jacobs and Carl Pohl had to run oh. the International Special Olympics Games ah. and uh, kind of got an MBA on the job. We were the largest sporting event in the world in 1991. Wow. had 6,000 athletes with mental disabilities from 100 countries here. and So it was, uh, it was a big, big uh, undertaking and, and, as I said, kind of got an MBA on the job. Then I was looking around for what I was going to do after that. That was my first, my first job out after baseball, after we won the World Series in 87. And... Um, what really interested me uh, was, um, uh, and I had used just about everybody to manage my own investments while I was a player, everybody from CPAs and investment advisors and stockbrokers and financial planners. And, and I, I kept, it kept gnawing at me. I said, I, I, I think I can do this better. And I just was really interested uh, in it. And uh, so I uh, got uh, trained and got started. I've been at it almost 20 years now. And We've got a uh, really nice business. We manage um, about three hundred and fifty million dollars, and, wow. and uh, so it's uh, it's a very nice business. That's great. Uh, I've dealt with Mr. Polad and well, dealt in the past tense with Mr. Polad, and I dealt with Erwin Jacobs when he's involved in Viking management, or at least trying to seize Viking right. management. Uh, and I I found them to be very interesting, in very different ways. I thought Carl was just one of those people. It, the one phrase that I heard Carl say that really stuck in my head was just. It's just math. In other words, you know, you, you can look at it as this incredible, huge enterprise, or you can just realize that if you do the math right, things work out. And Erwin Jacobs, I dealt with him. I found him to be more charismatic and also maybe even scarier. Uh, what was your take on either of them? Yeah, Erwin is a, um, is a uh, wonderfully uh, unique uh, guy. Um, he is the things that you say. He's funny. He's intense. Uh, he's very smart, very street smart, uh, and uh, can be uh, intimidating. He's, uh, I would say about Irwin, there's that, that old saying, you know, he's, he may be wrong, but he's never in doubt. <laughs> exactly. uh, and, uh, and, and so, I, you know, that's uh, Irwin's persona, and it's a big, big persona for sure. And he treated me wonderfully. We, I, uh, I, we had a great uh, friendship while I was uh, – he actually – contracted with Sarge and uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver. It was Eunice Kennedy's deal, the, the uh, Special Olympics, and he contracted with the Shrivers uh, to br- as the chairperson of the local organizing committee to bring those uh, Special Olympics games here in 91. It was a three-year planning event. He saw the games, which in 87 were in uh, the summer in, uh, 
87 at South Bend on the Notre Dame campus. And uh, Irwin has a uh, daughter um, who had uh, cerebral palsy and, and some uh, mental uh, retardation. And the Shrivers invited Irwin to see the games. And Irwin was so taken by that that he wanted the games for the Twin Cities. And the way I got involved, he, he said uh, he guaranteed the Shrivers against any shortfall. The Shrivers had never done the games at that time on anything other than a, than a college campus. And Irwin had, a, as true to Irwin fashion, he w- had this big L.A. Olympics kind of deal where it was all the, the venues, the athletic sites were all over the Twin Cities. And, and uh, Shrivers were nervous about that. Irwin guaranteed against any shortfall in the games, personally. Wow. They handed him the keys, and uh, uh, as the chairman of the local organizing committee, then to, as he tells the story, uh, he had breakfast with uh, Carl Polat on a regular basis. And, uh, of course, I had just retired from baseball after the 87 World Series. And uh, Irwin asked Carl at one of their breakfasts, he said, I've just taken on this project. I need an executive director. Who do you think I ought to get? And Carl said, you ought to get Roy Smalley to do it. And Irwin wow. said, what are you talking about, the ball player? <laughs> And Carl said, trust me on this one. It's not what you, not, not what you think. And so uh, Carl actually called me up after they'd had breakfast that day and said, uh, do you know Irwin? And I said, well, I just, I've just met him. I don't know him. And he said, well, Irwin has just taken on this Special Olympics obligation and opportunity. He wants to talk to you about running the thing. He said, call him up. So I, call, I said, well, Carl calls you up and says he wants you to talk to Irwin Jacobs. He, you kind of want to see where that's going. Yeah. So I called Irwin and he said, can you come down today at 2 o'clock, which I did. And the next thing I knew, I was back um, interviewing with the Shrivers and, and in Washington, D.C., and, and uh, came back, and uh, Irwin offered me the job, and that was it. Do you find the work now interesting? or is it? I mean, obviously, it's probably rewarding if you're successful at it, but do you find the moment-to-moment work interesting, or are you always sitting there thinking, man, I wish I was hitting a baseball? I will always wish I was hitting <laughs> baseball. You know, people ask me, oh, do I miss baseball? What I miss is being young enough to play baseball. <laughs> <laughs> I will always miss hitting a baseball. There's nothing like it in the world. Uh, practicing at it, uh, taking out in the game against the best competition in the world and on the mound and trying to do it. Uh, it's the hardest thing that I've ever experienced in sports and I think anybody would ever experience, and I, and I will always miss that. Now, that I've no longer young enough to do that. Uh, I love my uh, business. I love uh, doing what I do. It's a, it's a, it's a two-pronged business for me. Uh, uh, the first is managing the money that we, that we have under management. The second is going out and meeting other people and seeing if they'd like to work with us as well. So mm-hmm. between those two activities uh, during the course of a day, it's, uh, it's very rewarding. Uh, before I ask you about some actual sports, I do want to let people know uh, Kieran's has given away through Suhan Unfiltered two $25 gift cards to the the Timberwolves outlet at Target Center, so you can just take them over and use them as cash in that store. Uh, might give them away after the show, but if you happen to be listening live and heading down this way and you stop in at Kieran's and tell me, give me the sentence, Roy Smalley can hit... I will give you the gift card. Come up to me, tell me, Roy Smalley can hit. You win the gift card. Otherwise, we'll have a trivia quiz after the show if you'd like to stop by for that. All right, now, obviously we're going to end up talking baseball, but I am fascinated by – I've always been fascinated by Tiger Woods. I continue to be fascinated by him as he's going through what he's going through now. You, as someone who plays golf, who's very analytical, who understands sports, who understands the sporting mentality, what do you think when you see Tiger Woods sculling chips across a green? It's uh, astonishing, isn't it? It, it? it is just astonishing. And and here's what I think. Having you know, hit balls with sticks all my life, baseballs and bats starting now, uh, now golf clubs and golf balls, Both the, the two are very, very similar endeavors in a lot of ways. Not the least of which is that chasm between your ears. And, you, you know, since the incident with, you know, his wife and all of that stuff, he hadn't been the same in his head. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sure that's true. And if you're not right in the head, you can't hit a ball with a stick. I mean, you just can't. Uh, hitting a golf ball with a club is different in a lot of ways, you know, than making the uh, contact with a baseball and a base between a baseball and a baseball bat. But what's exactly the same is when you're trying to get your head straight and then you're trying to 
mechanically change your swing, and then you have doubts about both of those things, and then you get on the putting green. It's, to me, the biggest difference to Tiger, and listen to me talk like I'm an expert. I, I have no idea if I'm right, but this is what I think. He's not making the putts he hasn't for the last mm-hmm. five years. That he, he always made them, and you knew he was going to make them. When he had to make a big putt, he made that, and he hasn't done that in however many years, three, four, five years. And so the aura is gone. And so now he's struggling with trying to change the mechanics. His mind's a little messed up. His, the aura is gone, and he knows it because yep. he knew it when he had it, and he played on that, and now he knows he doesn't have it. They aren't afraid of him anymore. He's trying to get that back. There's just so many things swirling around, at the very least subconsciously, if not right in the forefront of his brain, that when he steps over a chip now, and whenever you have a little bit of doubt, anybody knows the game of golf, as plays golf, you step over that chip and you're not exactly sure how you're going to do it. You're thinking about mechanics and you're not thinking. With, with him, he knew he didn't have to think about mechanics before. He was going to make a chip. He knew how high he wanted the ball in the air. He knew where he wanted the ball to land. He knew what, what, you know, with whatever club it was. And he, he knew ex- exactly how to execute that. He's wondering how to execute it right now. And he's got all these other things swirling around in his mind. I mean, it's just like a hitter going in a slump. It's exactly the same thing. The amazing thing about Tiger, and I've covered him in a lot of majors and a lot of tournaments, he, he has won major tournaments when he wasn't even hitting the ball all that well. Because he'd always get up and down. He'd always make the putt he had to make to keep the round going. And so, you know, we can talk all we want about mechanics. I think it's more psychological, more aura. And he even brings it up now. In the past, there was really little doubt when he start, when he made the move to be the number one golfer. There's little doubt that he worked harder than everybody else. He lifted more weights. He hit more balls. He hit it, you know, for a while there, he hit it farther. And now he's, he's still long, but he's not longer than the, you know, the above average tour player. Uh, he still hits it a little more crooked than the average good tour player. And now he's not saving par every time he needs to save par. And he's not practicing as much. So, and so now, on top of all that, now he has an entire generation of young players who have never learned to fear him. And right. Those, and, and you know, so right. the aura really is gone. Oh, that's exactly right. And all those things, all those things play into the, the psychological aspect of it for Tiger. And uh, I think it's, you know, it's, I don't know how you change your swing mechanics as often as he has during, yeah. the, during the course of, uh, of one career. But I will tell you that just from baseball, that even the best guys would go into slumps where they doubted themselves, where they said, you know, boy, this always worked. I don't know why it's not working, mm-hmm. and I don't know what I have to do. And, and you play around and play around, and you try to do things mechan- but mechanically, but sooner or later it, it just comes back to the guys with a lot of talent because that ta- they can't mess up that talent. Right. Right? I think of Kirby Puckett and some of those guys. Paul Mulder was a guy. Mattingly, George Brett, those guys that were so good and so mechanically sound that they could lose it between the ears every once in a while. But it, it, it's like Yogi said when I asked him, I said, Yogi, you never went through a slump, did you? He goes, oh, yeah. He says, I was over 32 once. I said, how'd you get out of it? He said, I hit a home run. <laughs> I go, oh, okay, fine. That's not helping me. I'm over 18. I don't think that's covered. Uh, what did you think of Cal Ripken? You know, a Hall of Fame shortstop, uh, a, a rare power hitting shortstop like yourself, but when he went south, he would do. I mean, he would contort himself in the batter's box. Yeah. He would try a completely different approach. You ever seen how many batting stances Kent Herbeck went through in a given season? Yeah, uh, you know <laughs> that's a pretty good point. You know, I mean, the guys do that. You try. You know what you're trying to get to. Look, the moment of truth is when the hands and the big end of the ball move through the hitting zone at the right time on the right plane, and. You see different batting stances and different styles and different takeaways and all this kind of stuff, but they all get to that moment of truth in the same spot. And so when you're going through stuff, bad stuff, you just try different things that, that will help you, free you up to get to that spot at the right time. Herbie used to do all kinds of crazy things. And, you know, did he have to? Probably not. But, and uh, Ripken used to do the same thing. There aren't a whole lot of guys that don't change you know, where their hands are or where, you know, mm-hmm. what they're doing. At some point in time, they usually come back to the tried and true old faithful. But you do different things because it's a, 
you got to be a little crazy to play the game of baseball <laughs> to go up there and try to hit big league pitching anyway. And, and um, uh, you know, guys like Ripken and Herbie, me, I did the same thing. I did different things. You know, you just you do, you do the best you can to try to battle that pitcher. Do you remember any cases of somebody trying new stances and trying new hand positions and just having it all go south? Usually what happens if you get too carried away and don't have an awful lot of talent like Herbie did or like Ripken, uh, you can really, really get uh, messed up. There are guys that it does go south on, and I don't know whether it's because they tried something really, really crazy mechanically and then just lost it or if, you know, it, there wasn't enough there to begin with, right. you know, and they just could, could never get it back. But there, most of that is mental. Most of that is you just totally lose your confidence. You can't figure it out. Right. Uh, you were traveling a couple weeks ago, correct? Mexico? Yeah, I was in Mexico for, you go? for a week. Down to Ixtapa, Zihuatanejo. It's, oh, cool. Uh, yeah, I think you told me about it's that. It's about place. midway between Puerto Vallarta and Acapulco, roughly, roughly speaking. Not 88 bad. and sunny every day. It's our go-to spot. Not bad. Do um, you have any favorite spring? I'm going to be heading to spring training probably about a week and a half here. Do uh, you have any favorite spring training stories <laughs> that you can tell? You know, <laughs> It is a podcast, so you can pretty much say whatever the you hell know, you want. Spring training is such, a, is such a wonderful time. There are a lot, a lot of really, really great um, spring training stories. I'd, I'd have to sit. I'd have to sit and think about some. Whenever anybody asks me about spring training, one story always pops into my mind, and it's a Gene Mock story. And Good. Uh, you know, stop me if you if you've heard this one. But if I've told this already, I don't think we talked about this so. last time. It was uh, later on in spring training. It was really hot. We're training in Orlando at Old Tinker Field. Mm-hmm. Mock's the manager. I'm. And I'm playing shortstop. Bobby Randall and Rob Wolfong were the platoons at second base. So I played about five innings or so, and Gene took me out. And, and I can't remember if Bobby Randall went in to play second for Wolfong or, or if he was playing the whole game. But in any event, Bobby Randall's playing second. For people that have never heard of Bobby Randall or don't remember Bobby, he was a less than awesomely talented baseball player. But he had guts and heart, and the, the, his fa- he was a pretty good defensive player. But the best thing about it, what he loved more than anything else, was turning double plays. He thought that was the best thing in the world, and we made a bunch of them. We set uh, a major league record for double plays in 1979, and I set a record uh, in 79 for double plays by a shortstop that a year or two later Rick Burleson eclipsed by two. And if you take away Burleson, after Burleson and me, who are separated by two, there isn't anybody within 50 double plays of us. I mean, it was, wow. it, it was a lot. Anyway, Bobby's playing second base on this late in the game in this hot, hot Orlando spring training game. Harry Wendelstedt's the umpire at second base. Now, Harry Wendelstedt is about 5'10 in all directions <laughs> at, at the time, right? So he doesn't want to be out there. It's hot. Nobody wants to be there. It's late. It's a, it's a blowout game. There's a guy on first base, ground ball hit somewhere, shortstop or third base, Bobby Randall's the, the pivot man. Throw goes to Bobby for one, over to uh, first, what looks to be a double play. I'm sorry, Wendell sets the first base umpire. Wendell set calls him safe. Bobby jumps up after getting knocked down at, say, he jumped at second base on the pivot. He jumps up and takes three or four running steps toward Wendell and says, what, wait a minute, because you know, he's questioning the call because he wanted to make that double play. And Wendell said now is in a really bad mood anyway because he's out there. And he screams at Randall, you get your so-and-so rear end back over there. Don't be running at me. And uh, Bobby says something. So now Wendell said starts John at Randall. Well, Gene st- is going to step in. And from the dugout, I'm sitting next to Gene on the bench after having come out of the game. And, we, and Gene goes, take it easy, Harry. Take it easy. Take it easy. So Wendell said turns around and so starts John at Gene. Well, Gene's not in a bad mood. Gene's into this. But... Wendelstead is, starts yapping at him, so Gene says something back, something clever. Now Wendelstead's mad at Gene. He starts yelling at Gene, and finally Gene is, he snaps, and he yells something at Wendelstead. Now, this, you have to understand, this happens in rapid-fire mm-hmm. succession. There are no pauses. Gene says something. Wendelstead says, if you've got something to say, you come out, out here and say it. And Gene says, there ain't no room for anybody else out there. <laughs> <laughs> and Wendelstead st- stops, mouth agape. <laughs> Has no comeback and finally just says, Oh, ha, ha, ha. Turns around <laughs> and, and walks away. Didn't he? Didn't he, throw him. He, he, ab- he, shut, he absolutely shut him up. It, 
And we're on the bench howling. It was so the rapid fire nature. There was no hesitation in Mock's delivery, and I just I thought, man, that was, that was quick and perfect. That's beautiful. So, what's the best umpire argument you've ever seen? You have, or a favorite or umpire argument? Those those are the source of so many well, great stories. You have to remember, I I played for Billy Martin twice. I uh-huh. played for and I played for Gene. So I've got a pretty good start on most. And I played against Earl Weaver yes. for a lot of years. Best thing I ever saw was. The first time I ever saw Earl spin his hat when he was yes. when he was bill to bill hat to bill to hat bill with the umpire couldn't get close enough to him so he spun his hat around to get the bill out of the way so he could literally get his forehead to his forehead. That's I was in the opposing dugout and I lost it. That, that, I I think I saw the first time that ever happened and I howled. I it grew was, up I grew up watching Earl and there was that and then there was the I, Earl was maybe Billy did it first but Earl was the first I saw kick dirt all over the umpire's shoes. Yeah, I don't know who that would be a that would be a toss up who, who which guy did yeah, it, right. did it first. <laughs> it would probably also be a toss up about which guy did it the most. Right. <laughs> Cuz he did a lot. I saw I saw Billy Martin pick up two double handfuls of dirt and cover the plate. Just pick That's it up. That's awesome. Put it in his hands, cover the plate, get it all covered, then smooth it out with his foot so you could see none of the plate. <laughs> so the umpire had to work pretty hard to dust it off after he had thrown Billy out of the game. Tell me if you're like me. I used to love that stuff. I thought Earl Weaver was incredibly entertaining. I thought Martin was entertaining, looking at it from far. Now today when I see an umpire, when I see a manager go crazy, I kind of go, oh, come on. You know, isn't that a little silly? Then I loved it. Now I'm not sure I do. And I'm not sure what it is. I don't know if I've just gotten old and cranky or what. Yeah, I don't know. I um, I think it really depends on what the issue is and whether you really believe that the manager has uh, has an, that much of a beef, right? You know, and and um, the one thing you will know about those three guys that they they didn't do that uh, without believing that they were so right. Yeah. They could not stand it. Right. And that, the, the biggest thing that I, I saw in Mock was he knew better than the umpires. Uh-huh. And he knew he knew better. He knew the <laughs> rules better. And he felt like in the given call, he knew, the, he knew the, that he was right about how he was challenging the umpire. And what would ultimately set him off is the umpires would say something away from the argument that would be um, – more, not personal, but it would be um, overly defensive and, and out, at, off the track uh, of the argument. In other words, they, bad personality would come, ah. you know, would come out. And that would, that would make the top of their heads, uh, you know, Billy and Gene, but Gene especially, the top of his head would come off when he's arguing with the guy and the guy finally says something that's borderline personal and, you know, and... Um, uh, imperious, you know what I mean, and, yep. I, and, and that's the worst thing about umpires when they when they adopt that that imperiousness about them, about their attitude. When they're the king, and you know you have no right to be breathing their air anymore, mm-hmm. that's when you, it, that's when it makes anybody crazy. Right. Let's go back to the double plays. Uh, I'm. I mean, how do you turn? How do you explain turning that many double plays? What is it? Because I'm I'm sure there have been shortstops who maybe. You know, like Ozzy Smith probably got to more balls than you did. No question about but that. But you turn more double plays. How does that work? Well, I, I, the, a lot of it obviously is opportunity. I mean, we had pitching staffs in those days that, that A, either threw a lot of ground balls uh, all the time, or B, let a lot of guys get on base, yeah. uh, you know, when they're, and then ground balls, you know, showed up. Um, and we didn't miss many, you know. I mean, we, were real, we worked at it. We were really, really good at it. So... Uh, there were countless guys um, in the league before me and since who had way better range than I ever had. And you saw, and say, so Ozzie Smith got to more balls. Um, I don't know. I led the league in total chances, put outs, assists, double plays three years in a row. So I was getting to a lot of balls. Yeah. Um, and what, it's just that I, my range, Ozzie had half again, you know, better range than, than I had. But most of my range happened before the pitch was made anyway. I mean, I, uh, I, was, I, I studied hitters. I studied our pitchers. I positioned myself in, in such a way that and I had a really good arm, pretty good hands, 
generally speaking, if I got to it, I was going to catch it and I was going to get it to the right place in a, in a hurry, right? So, you know, we had opportunity. We worked at it. We worked at how we could limit our limitations or expand our, our, our abilities. And, uh, you know, we just got it done. Well, I, I had the treat of growing up. I mean, so, you know, we weren't very, we weren't rich, so we'd sit in the bleachers a lot. But when we did sit, sit in the lower bowl, usually we had tickets right by third base. So I'm watching Brooks Robinson and Belanger and then either Dower or Gritch, you know, over on second base. I'll tell you a great story about Richie Dower and Weaver. Good. Um, and I always just, I always studied that as, you know, as I was a little league ball player, I always studied how much they would move before the pitch, how they always seemed to know, you know, very rarely did you see them move before the pitch and regret it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. There, I didn't have great range, so I, I had to figure out how to, how to play range by position. And, um, you know, I think it's one of the reasons why, you know, when you're playing shortstop on a limited ability basis in terms of, you know, range, and you have to study your own pitchers and what they throw, that you have to see how the hitters react to it, study the other hitters, watch counts. You know, I mean, you do that for 13 years, you start knowing some stuff about the game and a lot of different aspects of it. You know, you have, and, and I think that's why middle infielders and catchers make good managers to, mm-hmm. to, to a great degree because they just have to be into all aspects of the game most of the time. Right. And uh, there are some, <coughs> excuse me, there are some interesting uh, positioning stories um, a- as well. Uh, one time we were playing in Seattle, and uh, Al Cowens had been traded from the Royals to the Mariners. Dave Goles was pitching for us uh, one night in, in Seattle, and I, I could tell that Cowens was a little down about leaving the Royals anyway. I mean, that was where he had become a really, really good player. He loved all his teammates there. Got traded to Seattle. He just didn't – I don't think he even felt like he was the same player. He didn't look like the same player. But anyway, I, th- I felt like there was a lot of emotion going on with him, a lot of, a lot of ego in, in involved. And, uh, his first time up, Dave Goltz got in his kitchen big time. I mean, he must have hit him with a fastball two inches above the thumbs and Ooh. just shattered his bat. And he ha- hardly ran down to first. I mean, Cowens, he was so mad and, and hurt, you know, at that. So the next time he came up, I just knew in my heart there was no – I didn't know what Goltz he was going to throw him. There was no way that he was not going to get the bat head out in front of him. You know. So I moved over. He got in the batter's box and dug in. And when he wasn't, you know, when he started looking at the pitcher, I moved over. I was dead in the hole hmm. at shortstop. And I figured for this particular hitter, shortstop position just went from kind of five or eight feet off a of second base to 20 feet off a of third. It just shifted my shortstop position now was three feet either side of the hole. Mm-hmm. And I stood dead in the middle of the hole. Goals, uh, Butch Weiner called for a fastball. He threw him a fastball on the inside part of the plate, and Cowens hit a bullet one hopper right at me. He hit the ball, and as soon as he hit it, he knew he had to hit. And then it, I was standing in front of the ball. He looked up, and he almost turned around and walked back. <laughs> and down. He stopped. He couldn't believe it. He stopped and hardly ran to first base. But, you know, that's you got to – when you were me, you had to do those kinds of things. Yeah. What's your Rich Dower story? <laughs> oh, Richie Dower. He and I were teammates at USC. Wow. And um, so when he got up to the big leagues, I got to the big leagues uh, in uh, 75. He played in college in 75. I think he got up to the big leagues in like 78 or thereabouts, 77, 78, 79, something like that. So he comes up. And when we went into Baltimore, I see him before the game around the batting cage and I went over to give him a hug and I said how's it playing for Earl and he starts laughing he goes I got to, he says I got to tell you my my first uh major league experience with Earl he said I come up it's my first day up in the big leagues he puts me right in the lineup playing second base first time I get up is this is Dower talking he says first time I get up he said I got runners on first and second I hit a bullet line drive right at the shortstop catches it doubles the runner off second base we're out of the inning he said, the next time up, I'm, I get up with the bases loaded. I hit a rocket down the third baseline. Third baseman snags it, steps on third, throws me out at first. You know, one, I thought it was a double. A guy makes a great diving play, gets up, double play. Last time up, two guys on. 
I hit a line shot at second base. Second baseman, four six three double play. I come back to dugout now. He's been up three times. I've hit three rockets. I've left seven guys on base. I come back to the dugout. Earl comes up to me and says, "Don't you ever strike out?" <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, you know, I read Earl Weaver's book when I was young. I read Jim Palmer's book where he basically spent the whole book making fun of Earl Weaver. <laughs> yeah. I read Brooks Robinson's book. You know, they, there were some characters and they they told stories. Oh, you know? they did have stories. Um, let's let's go big picture here now. Bud Selig is stepping down. Rob Manfred is taking over. Now you're someone who's capable. Of, you know what baseball used to be like. You know what baseball is like. You understand finances. What is your your view of Bud Selig as a commissioner and and did you like the guy? You know, I there are a lot of things, a lot of negative things that I've I've heard about uh, Bud in my conversations with uh, Bud and any any deal I ever had with him. He was always a gentleman. He was always thoughtful. I, you know, I thought I I don't have any reason to say anything bad about uh, Bud Selig. So it's hard. I mean, I've heard all the story. I've heard other people have some things to say about him. In the end. I think you have to look at anybody's job, say what what is the ideal to be accomplished here in this job, and how do you do? And you look at the economics of baseball from the time he took over to when he left, and you go, I think you got to say, I don't know, it was on his watch that baseball has done pretty doggone well. So I, I think you'd be hard-pressed to say that he wasn't a terrific commissioner. Now, were there other people involved that made it happen? I mean, it, it, obviously, it, he wasn't the um, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis. You know, he was—he wasn't a, a a guy that took the game by the throat and and shook it and made it what he wanted. But he, from what I saw, he was the opposite. Of that he was a consensus builder and a cajoler yep. and a and you know, in this day and age where you've got. Owners' egos and bankrolls, you know, bigger than as big or bigger than the players, and those are the sides that are, and the players' representatives. To accomplish what got accomplished under the Bud Selig's watch, watch, I got to say, how can you find a whole lot of fault with it? Yeah, I tend to agree with pretty much everything you said, and here, here's the point I make. I think the average fan wants the commissioner to be a godlike figure who makes things happen, who, who, who ordains things. And that doesn't work that way. He is the employee of the owners. And I think that was the Bud's subtle genius was being in charge, but never making the owners feel like he was anything other than doing their bidding, you know, finding a way to, because if you don't build consensus, you're not going to get anything done. Right. And the biggest thing for me, I started covering baseball in 1993. And at that point, I'd go to Cleveland, and I was—I'd feel like I was in a building that should be condemned. Yeah, you yeah. know, I'd go to—I'd go to Baltimore, and I, you know, I think Baltimore closed down '92, but I, I'd been there. You know, there were so many ballparks I went there. I said, "God, you know, I could get electrocuted. Uh, I could have something fall from the ceiling <laughs> and kill me during the game." You know, they could be bitten on the ankle by a rat. Yeah, there were just <laughs> there were there were as for even for somebody who loves baseball, there were some horrible places yeah. to go, whether you're a fan or a writer or a ball player. So I start covering the team, the game in '93, and however many years later, 20 years later, not 80 to 90 percent of the ballparks are stunning. They're beautiful. They're great places to spend time. Look at the thing about Target Field, and I know the Twins have struggled. Nobody's trying to cover that up. The thing about Target Field is, you can go there and not care about the result of the game and have a great time. And that's Absolutely. the modern ballpark. Absolutely, and and that will probably you know the. Financial health of the game, the relative um, calm and benign nature of the uh, relationship between yep. the owners and, and the Players Association uh, now, the beauty and success, financial and otherwise, of the ballparks and the clubs that are now in place. I mean, that's that's got to be. I, I mean, you can't deny, but that that legacy of those of those components. I, I just don't see how you how you can deny that and. However he got there, I mean, here we are. And, you know, I know people were, there are a lot of people that will never get over the blackmailing, the appearance of the blackmail of, you know, we're going to 
the club's going to pick up and move if you don't if if public tax dollars don't build the stadiums and and I understand uh, that uh, animus, mm-hmm. uh, you know about about that the heavy handedness uh, of that and um, and I get all that and yet out the other side. The city's making money. The state's making money. We're all happy with Target Center, for example. And, and this is the same around in every in yep. every city. It's always an ugly it's, business getting a stadium it, built. It has be, it has brought more money to everybody and more excitement and happiness to everybody that cares about it. the proofs in the pudding. Yeah, uh, the big black mark on Seelig's tenure is obviously that he was he presided over the steroid era. And that's what I hear most from fans is, you know, how can you let this guy off the hook? Because I've, I've been generally pro-Bud. I've had my, you know, you, anybody serves in that position for that long, you're going to have differences of opinion. But in general, I thought he's been a pretty good, co- co- you know, custodian of the game. And I always get the response, yeah, but he let, he let players off the hook for taking steroids. He didn't do anything to shut it down. And my answer to that is always, well, two things. First of all, I think st- players were probably doing steroids before they started getting caught. Um, There's no question about that. Yeah. Uh, number two, you have you can't just say, "Wow, McGuire's arms are big. I'm going to suspend him." There has to be some real proof before you take any of those steps. The other thing is, everybody was celebrating the return of baseball to the grand stage during '98 and during the social McGuire home, as purely as a businessman. That's not when you step in and punish those guys. You don't take them <laughs> off the field on September 12th and say, well, okay, we're going to drug test you every day now. I think you let it play out a little bit there. You know, the, the, one, the one point that, you, uh, that you're uh, kind of implying there, too, that's as important as all, and I agree with all of them, but when you, it goes back to your earlier statement. He's the commissioner uh, appointed by the, hired by the owners. He's not the emperor. There's another side to this, and that's the Players Association that fought him tooth and nail yep. uh, against drug testing yep. every single day for a lot of years. And I put I lay that at the feet of the uh, of the Players Association. Also, I mean, the two sides should have gotten together and stopped that deal before McGuire and so you know before that ever became a well maybe not this year yeah. type of deal. It was going on for a long time. I think everybody knew it. And for the Players Association, here's the one thing that, I mean, I, I really like the Players Association. They did a lot for players, a lot for me as a part of that. But that, as a, as a union, I know your job is to protect your uh, union members. But there are bigger issues than just the players' rights. There's, the game is bigger than the players uh, having their privacy invaded upon to test for whether or not they're ruining the legacy of the game mm-hmm. by cheating. It's a it, it it's bigger than that, and the game is bigger than that. And and so, the players' association is at equal fault, if not more, because it took a long time of Bud trying to get things done from a testing standpoint before the players' association finally agreed to anything that had any kind of teeth in it right and that's just the, that's just a fact just in terms of the way the game is played you know one thing about the steroid era was it was highly entertaining <laughs> you saw yeah, balls flying out of the ballpark right. records being set well it looked like gladiators too you got yeah. these big guys Absolutely. that are gigantic they walk up and they hit the ball nine miles and they do it 70 times yeah holy cow that's is fun so so just in the way the game is played do you prefer the offensive onslaught do you prefer the low scoring pitchers duel what what do you prefer out of a baseball game i don't have a preference uh for watching a good ball game uh, you know two to one can be a wonderful ball game mm-hmm. um as can 12 to 10 and um if the 12 to 10 game is not sloppily played in the field and not 12 to 10 because you walk the you know bases loaded and then give up a hit and walk two more and then give up a home run. i mean if it's if it's just the fact that the the hitters are beating the pitchers around a little bit, that's a. I I can I can watch that game. I think it's really fun. We played an awful lot of those in seventy eight yeah. and seventy seven, seventy eight and seventy nine. Yeah. I remember in seventy seven, especially against the White Sox, when you know we had um, 
our lineup was Lyman Bostock, then me, then Carew, then Heisel, uh, Jose Morales, and, and uh, Glenn Adams, and some of those guys. And the White Sox had uh, Oscar Gamble and Richie Zisk and Eric Soderholm and Jim Spencer. And, and we used to play a lot of 12 to 10 games because yeah. neither of our pitching staffs were very good, and we could all hit. Those are kind of fun. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So I like all baseball that's, that's well played, whatever it is. I enjoyed watching Sosa and McGuire do that. I, and I enjoyed it as much as anybody else. I just hate the fact that it was um, chemically enhanced. Of course. I, you know, just, yeah, absolutely. It was entertaining, though. Um, that's Roy Smalley. I'm Jim Suhan. This is Suhan Unfiltered at SuhanUnfiltered.com. If you happen to be listening on your way downtown, if you're going to the Wolves game or just coming out, we are at Kieran's Irish Pub. Friday night I'll be at O'Gara's, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock with Michael Russo. And then my band is playing 7.30 to 9. Kind of classic rock comfort, comfort food uh, on stage. If you're listening and you come in to Kieran's tonight and find me and say Roy Smalley can hit, I will give you a $25 gift card to the Timberwolves outlet shop at Target Center. Uh, how much has spring training changed, Roy, since you started playing? I think spring training has changed in um, because of the way um, athletes, basically the players playing at a Wait, and they can't run down to first the first day. You know, that kind of, I mean, they're literally spring training is to get in shape. Right. And then they go out and play where spring training now, uh, more than ever, guys are in shape when they get there. They're, uh, they're trying to get even better. 